If you really want to scare a junior firmware developer, just whisper one word into their ear Yogto. and see them running away in tears. Before we begin, let me make one thing very clear. I'm not an expert when it comes to Yocto, not by a long shot. In fact, it's only been a couple of months since I started using it to develop firmware images for our board. And what I'm about to show you are the results of these pa uh, past couple of months worth of work, right? Which means that if you think I've made a mistake anywhere and know a better way to do any particular thing, please, knock yourself out in the comments below. Okay, with that out of the way, let's talk about the logistics of this video. You see, at first I was planning to push the code we'll talk about here to GitHub, but decided not to do so, uh, primarily for two reasons. First, I want you to not just look at the code that I'll show you on screen, but also follow along, which is why I'm going to put all the code either in an article on our documentation page or in a gist so that you'll be able to go through every line at your own pace, but will still need to at least create all the necessary files for yourself and paste this code in. I'll leave the link to this code, of course, in the description. And the second reason, well, the code we're about to write isn't just some demo code, it will actually be useful and deployable on our development boards and if you've been following their journey for any length of time really, then you already know that they will come with two possible boot sources, a NOR chip and an eMMC boot partition. And while the NOR chip will contain all the firmware necessary for the boards to boot properly and will be flashed during the production of the boards, we decided we'll keep the eMMC boot partitions empty and that's on purpose. We've had a number of internal discussions whether that's the right call to make, but ultimately decided that it is. I mean, the whole point of having the NOR flash in the first place is to isolate the production firmware, but also allow you to have a playground environment that you can try and boot from by yourself, right? And it's the eMMC boot partitions that are this playground environment. And in this video, we'll use Yocto to build a bootable image that you'll be able to flash onto these partitions and have the bragging rights of running your own firmware on your router. Now, because I'm a big believer in learning by doing, we won't spend much time in any kind of introductions or theories when it comes to Yocto. We'll simply start by creating the necessary files and explain things along the way. But before we get there, I think it's worth mentioning the difference between a couple of words I might uh, use interchangeably throughout these videos and in many cases, they mean the same thing. Bitbake, Open Embedded, and of course, Yocto. Bitbake is fairly straightforward. It takes the recipe files that we're going to write in these videos and turn them into whatever we want. A program, a package, a tarball, a bootloader, whatever, right? It's a program that we run whenever we want to build artifacts. Next, we have Open Embedded, which in a nutshell is a collection of base recipes. Say you want to build an embedded Linux image with networking support and you want IP Route 2 to be a part of this package. You can, of course, write the recipe for it by yourself, but since this is a fairly common and standard package, Open Embedded already ships with a recipe that you can be sure works straight out of the box. Apart from bringing a ton of recipes to the table, it also defines the base metal layer. Uh, you'll learn what layers are soon enough. In fact, we're going to spend these couple of videos building one but these layers, of course, need to start somewhere and it's open embedded where they start. And finally, we have Yocto, which is an umbrella term that basically brings everything together. So Bitbake, open embedded, people and communities that work on separate parts of the project and companies that participate either financially or with development time. Think of it like this. Open embedded is the code and Yocto are the logistics around this code. Okay, now that you know what's what, time to write some code. The first thing we're going to do is make a new directory and we're going to name it MetaMono. Now, this is just a directory at the moment, so let's turn it into a Yocto layer by creating the conv directory first and in it a layer.conv file with the following contents. This is the most basic layer configuration and as you'll see going forward, most files are organized this way. So you basically have a bunch of variables, some of which can be overridden by using suffixes such as the meta mono in our case. 
The important lines I want to mention here are the BB files, which are just two directory paths constructed with wildcards so that Bitbake knows which files to include when building firmware. Then we define the collection and let Bitbake know which files belong to this collection, which in our case are all the files whose full paths begin with the layer dir, which will get resolved to metamono. Just like with the BB files variable, we're painting with the widest stroke possible here and just include all the files in our layer. But if we wanted, we could separate them into multiple collections or even add some recipes we're about to write to collections in other layers. You'll see this variable assignment pattern quite a lot going forward, so I think it's worth making sure you really understand what it means. Take the BB file collections variable, for example. It has a plus equals operator, which means we're adding meta mono on top of what's already added by Bitbake, which we'll get to shortly. Then in the next line, we have the BB file pattern variable, which we override by using the underscore meta mono suffix. This approach basically says, take the BB file pattern and override it specifically for the meta mono layer. And in this overwrite, I want all the file names, which also include full paths to those files to be in that pattern. And finally, make sure the priority is higher than the rest of them. This last part is important because if you include other layers that include recipes for the same packages or programs that yours does, you want to make sure that your take precedence, right? And now that you know how variables are assigned and overridden, you shouldn't have trouble understanding the last two lines, which define the dependencies and compatibility of our layer with the particular Yocto release. We're using Walnescar at the time of recording this video, but as you can see, Yocto releases two new versions per year, so you might want to double check what's currently the stable version, depending on when it is that you're watching this tutorial. Okay, now that our layer is defined, we'll do some housekeeping in advance, so to speak. You see, Yocto, or Bitbake specifically, uses a ton of disk space to do its job, but because it knows it's very resource intensive, it gives us a couple of options to optimize, um, not so much the consumption of disk space, but caching a lot of its steps to make sure they're not repeated unnecessarily, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to create two directories that are outside of layer directory and we'll name one as state minus cache and the other one downloads. If you remember our IP route two package we mentioned earlier, when we build it, we need to download it first, of course. So Bitbake will put it in the downloads directory and leave it there for any future builds of the same version. Shared state cache directory, on the other hand, is where Bitbake will save the state cache. Again, if we look at the IP route 2 package or its building process, first it needs to get downloaded, then it needs to get uncompressed, then it needs to be compiled, then moved to the right directory and so on and so forth. Well, in case any of these steps break, their intermediary results are stored in these shared state caches so that Bitbake doesn't need to repeat all the prior steps for every single run, right? Now, these external directories don't just get included in our build process automatically, uh, which is why we also need to create a conf slash side.conf file in which we'll let Bitbake know to use these directories instead of what it normally uses, which is the very directory that our layer code is in. So in our case, metamono. If you intend to add this project to Git, then also make sure you add this site.conf file to Git ignore because it's a local configuration file, meaning it only pertains to the machine you're planning to build the firmware on, right? It gets automatically loaded by Bitbake if present, so we don't need to add it anywhere. So let's just move on to what is called the setup tool. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. When I developed my custom mechanical keyboard, PCBWay manufactured both the prototypes as well as the production PCBs and the quality was nothing short of exceptional. So for our router project, I knew exactly who to turn to. They've produced prototypes for us throughout this entire journey, like the M.2 fit test cards, CNC milled plastic and aluminum enclosures, and even some parts for the final production units. PCBWay offers everything from PCB manufacturing to 3D printing, injection molding, and even sheet metal fabrication. Check them out using the link in the description. Now, if you've built, or should I say compiled any software by hand before, 
Then you already know there's a bunch of parameters that you need to pass on to this compilation tool, uh, especially if you're cross-compiling for another architecture, like we're trying to do so here. At the minimum, what you need to do is set the cross-compile and arch flags on top of having an already configured cross-compilation toolchain somewhere on your uh, file system. It gets very complicated very fast, and simplifying this process is also another goal of Yocto, which it does with something called Pocky. Now, if you look at the official documentation, Pocky is what is called the reference distribution, but to be honest, for my taste, it's just too much of a black box that does way too many things and brings too much complexity to the table. Not to mention it's very opinionated, uh, so we're not going to use it, like, at all. Instead, what we're going to use is a tool called CAS, which, unlike Pocky, does one thing and does it well, it sets up the environment. It's been developed by Siemens, and folks at Siemens know a thing or two about embedded development, so I think we're in safe hands using it instead of Pocky. I already have CAS installed on this machine, so let's go ahead and create a directory named CAS and inside a single file which we'll call firmware.yaml. Looking at this file, let's skip the machine and distro for now because we'll focus on them much more shortly. So what we're left with are the repositories that we want to include in our project, or to put it more correctly, we want CAS to make sure they get included in our project and in our case, there's only three of them. First, we of course want the bitbake tool, which is our task runner, and because it has no layer itself, we also need to make sure its base directory isn't enabled as a layer. We have to do so because by default, CAS does indeed expect every repo to be a layer, and in most cases they are, bitbake being more of an exception rather than the rule. Then we bring in what every Yocto project needs, the open embedded core, which as we already established, is where the base meta layer is defined. And finally, we're also including our own layer. See how we also defined which branch of the open embedded core we want? This needs to align with whatever compatibility we've set in our own layer.com file earlier. And if these two don't match, our layer won't build. And yes, we could set the compatibility of our layer to multiple Yocto releases, not just one, right? Okay, now let's talk about the machine and distro values in the CAS file, which are two of the main three entities that define how our firmware gets built. Machine, as the name suggests, is the hardware configuration that we're building our firmware for, and here we define things such as the architecture, which in our case is ARM64, the microarchitecture, which in our case is Cortex-A72, uh, what kind of serial console we use, how and which kernel it should use, uh, which device tree describes how things fit together, and so on. So let's go ahead and create a gateway-dk.conf in our conf machine directory and populate it with variables that best define our hardware. As you can see, we're using the bare minimum here. In fact, I've set the kernel to Linux minus dummy simply because at this stage we're not interested in building the kernel itself and the dummy is just a placeholder because Yocto does expect a kernel even if we're building an image without one. By far the most important line in this file is this require here, because it lets the compiler know which flags to apply so that the end code will actually run on our CPU, right? We'll come back to this file later on when we actually need to build the kernel, but for now, let's move on to the second entity we need to define, and that's the distro. Same as with the machine, we'll create a distro directory inside the conf directory, name the actual distro file recovery.conf and put this code in. If you're thinking that distro in Yocto resembles what you already know about various Linux distributions, then you're pretty much spot on. Distro is used to tell Yocto how you want the final image to be built, which is to say uh, what init, uh, init manager you want, which login manager you want, what C library you want to build it with, uh, and even pass it the toolchain and compiler settings that you think will fit your use case best. Think of Debian versus Alpine Linux in the context of distributions. Debian uses glibc for the C library and systemd for the init system, while Alpine uses muscle and openrc. And that brings us to the final entity with, of the three, and that's the image. If the distro tells Bitbake how to build it, 
then the image tells it what it needs to contain. So if Debian is a distro, then Debian server is the image versus Debian desktop or Debian minimal, which are different images because they contain different software and packages, but still belong to the same distro, right? That said, we're not going to build the image just yet because we don't need to. Yocto already comes with a default image that contains everything needed for a bootable system. So let's instead just go ahead and build what we've defined so far. Simply run cas build cas slash firmware.yaml and grab a coffee because for the first time, depending on the CPU that you're using and the amount of memory your system has, this can not only take minutes, but likely hours, which gives you plenty of time to analyze the output that Bitbake provides, most notably the Bitbake minus C build core image minimal. The core image minimal is the default image it resorted to because we have not defined our own yet. But before we check its contents, let's look at a more practical way of building an image, which starts by first going into the cast shell. To do so, simply run cas shell cas firmware yaml rather than cas build, and you'll find yourself in an environment that's been set up by cas specifically to be used by Bitbake, which you'll use not only to build images, but also investigate potential issues when a particular build fails, right? So let's build our image again, this time by using Bitbake directly. This time around, it should take no longer than a couple of seconds, because if you remember, we've set the shared state cache directory in one of the earlier steps, and it's that directory that Yocto pulls the information about the build artifacts uh, from and uses those if available. Okay, now that Bitbake is done, let's first make sure that our image is indeed where it should be, which is the TMP deploy image gateway minus DK. If you're curious about which packages ended up in the minimal image, then feel free to check out the manifest file. But for now, let's just check the actual root file system contents by running zcat on it and passing it through cpio command. There we go. We've just built a minimal bootable root file system for an ARM chip, but the keen-eyed among you are probably wondering why did I choose to build a cpio image rather than an ext4 one. Well, that's because we're writing firmware. And if you remember from earlier, we did name our distro recovery, which means this root file system is going to become an initial RAM file system and will get embedded into the kernel image directly. And for that, it needs to be in the CPIO format. We'll do that in the next video because this one is already plenty long as it is. So make sure you're subscribed, click the bell icon to get notified when the next video in the series comes out. And in case you learned anything new, a like would be more than appreciated. Tomasz from Slovenia, signing out.